question one, we're going to, to go into, and we're going to go again around the table. And now we're going to get us started to get into some of the nitty gritty. Just a reminder to you, those of you out there listening, thanks for all your feedback on why you're on the call. If you hear things that intrigue you, you want to find out more, please just stick a question in there. We'll try and get back and answer it later on. But if we don't, we're going to do some follow-up stuff. It may be even another webinar, as Richard mentioned, but certainly there'll be at least an email or two to everybody that's registered afterwards with um, links to information where you can find out a bit more. But our first question, and I sort of touched on this, now we want to get into some of the why, the purpose of these groups, so what they're doing, what the group's actually all about, what it's trying to address, but why? What's the group's purpose? Why did people come together? What are they ultimately going to achieve? Because that's um, A, what's unique, but B, that's the, the first thing to really have clear with, I think, a lot of these groups. that They're not just a good idea. I mean, they can be a lot of fun, but they're there to achieve something, hopefully. Remember, you can put in questions, and if you want, if you hear something you like, you can hit that thumbs up or that little clap button. But again, a random assortment here. Peter, Mitchell, you get to go first. Um, tell us what Noslam are up to and, and why Noslam actually exists. Okay, um, so we uh, we exist probably initially out of the need um, for questions around uh, water and the environment, um, but we've grown to be something a lot more than that. Um, so we have a, um, a mission statement or something was that effect, um, and that is to have an environment that we are proud of a vibrant community and strong agriculture in North Otago. And so why do we have that as our, um, our mission statement or our goal? Uh, well, there are some things that we are not, um, that I guess we don't feel proud about in our, or comfortable about in our environment. And also, as I said before, there's, uh, uh, we've been through uh, you know, some challenges with right to farm issues, I suppose, or we feel that emotional pressure or whatever you want to call it um, and of course we want we do want a, a vibrant community and strong agriculture and so and we learnt that by um, going through a, um, a land care um, project three it was a three-year project a number of years ago and and we were connecting with the wider community and other stakeholders and that made us realize that we need to we need to do this as a, a wider community and and work um, with the community, listen to them, and go on the journey together. Um, we have quite a formal structure. We are an incorporated society. So why are we an incorporated society? Well, it gives us a legal framework, which gives us boundaries um, of where we operate and how we operate, and it also gives us um, where we shouldn't operate and um, and how we should conduct ourselves. Uh, the um, It also gives us um, our, our funders, because we our, our group is funded, and so um, it gives those funders a backing of a legal framework so that we're responsible, we're responsible for the money that they give us and um, therefore we can um, we've got a structure there that we can return, give them a return on their investment that um, with their funding. We also employ a coordinator. So why do we employ a coordinator? Um, well, without one, it would be would be two start stop. Uh, we've got harvest, lambing, carving, etc. That always got in the way, and we initially started off the first couple of years, and it was it was hopeless. We were you know harvest lambing. Um, carving etc got in the way and we were just far too we didn't have enough um, continuity and consistency and things we were trying to do uh, so we got some funding and employed a coordinator and we've just um, been going forward in leaps and bounds uh, it's not sustainable in my opinion or in, in Noslam's committee's opinion that um, that you can do it without a coordinator the way we're doing it you just get volunteer burnout and um, it's, it's, um, this is a generational, we believe the catchment group is a generational thing. And um, so volunteer burnout. Uh, and also admin, there's a lot of admin involved in these groups. And uh, as a general rule, farmers like to be farmers, not administrators. 
Uh, we're also, as I said before, we have a legal, legal framework that gives us boundaries. And so we're not political. We're not a lobby group. That's in our rules. Why is that? Uh, because our focus is around the promotion of good management practice. And we also want to connect with the wider community and other catchment stakeholders. And that's easier to build trust with those groups and tell the agricultural story if we're not being political. So I'll just leave, leave that part of the question there. Brilliant. Thanks, Peter. No, we are going to come back and, and drill in. But next one on our list of uh, why your group actually exists. Uh, Roger, tell us about your group and what the motivation was, what you're trying to achieve. You're muted, Roger. Still muted, Roger. No, I'm, I'm talking to myself whilst I'm um, sorry. <laughs> um, gotcha. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, really good question, really important one. Um, why did we get going? Um, it's really simple to me. Um, you know, the primary industry is based in the environment. And for the last hundred years, we've had a top-down um, mentality with we, us being told what we've got to do on a daily basis or how we've got to manage our resources. And we can all sit back as farmers and continue with that um, and accept that and accept the government um, responding to society and saying we've got to clean up our waters and we've got to look after our soils. Or we can upside down and get motivated as farmers and form catchment groups and actually work um, to achieve that without the top-down approach and come from a bottom-up approach. And that's the whole context of why we've got going, to come from the, um, from the bottom-up approach uh, and get together. Because everyone in this country wants clean waters, wants to look after their soils um, and, and basically be sustainable with the environment. It's really simple. Um, and the reason farmers, we might be a little bit behind at the moment, um, and it's not deliberate. Uh, it, it's, it's simply because people don't understand. It's a very, very complex um, science. Uh, and farmers aren't trained as, as scientists and biologists about soils and waters. So the community catchments allow us to um, get together and educate each other and, and lift our standards and um, catch up to where society wants us. So our group is all about um, actually taking control of our business and taking control of our environment. Um, so that's why we got going. Uh, what, have we, what have we done? Um, as I said, we're in the Horizons region and uh, I put a, I'm, I'm part of Mark's group, um, the Beef and Lamb, the Environmental Reference Group. And I thought Shuck's got to do something. Um, so rather than start up a little sub-catchment, I said, no, let's go for the whole Orangatiki, and, uh, which is what I did. Um, and I got support from a number of farmers. Uh, we had three meetings and basically we had, so we've ended up setting up an incorporated society over the whole of the Rangitiki. Um, and the fungi who's joined us and the Turkina Valley's um, wedged in between. And our aim is to cover the whole area, um, but I am chair of the incorporated society over the top, uh, which allows the sub catchments to operate underneath. And their job is to do what I just spoke about um, the incorporated society's job is to capture all the data and support the subcatchments. It's really simple. Um, we, we provide the formal structure uh, to catch money or to, get to, 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 to hold on to money because there's lots of people who want to support us, the government, regional councils, fertilizer companies, they all want to support us, but they're just not going to give you money. Uh, you've got to have a formal structure. So that's what our corporate society is for. That's over the top. Um, it also employs an, a coordinator. Um, we've got a fantastic one. And that person's job is to go around and help all the subcatchments um, do all their water testing or do whatever they want to do. Um, capture the data, do the administration, and basically just support those subcatchments. Um, so that's, that's probably enough, isn't it, Aaron, to answer that question? Yeah, and I think we're getting questions coming in and we'll, we'll dig into that a wee bit more deeper. Thanks, Roger. Um, Rick. You're next on my list. What's, uh, tell us about your group, what you're doing, why you're doing it. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. More than, more than just the wee fish, right? Okay. Yeah, a little bit of history. Um, where we farm um, has historically has had the biggest sediment load coming out of the Tamania catchment, the heart of our farm, into the Taranga Moana, the harbour. So uh, 20 years ago, we were approached by the regional council to embark on a land environmental plan. Um, we did that based on LUC, land use capability. Didn't use a, the um, soil mapping as such, but used the principles 
to uh, redesign our farm. So 20 years on, we've had fantastic results. Our, we took the original council, our scorecard was about one out of 10 back then. It's now uh, nine, 10 out of 10. Um, we've made a huge difference to, um, to bitterty, the sediment going to the harbour, but it also um, reduced a lot of nutrient through restoration of wetlands um, and focus on critical source areas, et cetera. So in doing that, we thought, well, how can we replicate this across the whole catchment, or not only our catchment, other catchments? So I'm part of our farmers' leaders group with Project Parori. Um, just like Roger and Pete, we have a governance structure um, so that we can, um, uh, a, a legal structure so that we can um, attract funding. Um, and the, the, the whole focus has been um, getting uh, the, the stakeholders, that's the orchardists, uh, that's avocado, kiwi fruit, dairy farms, sheep and beef farms, to understand why we are doing this. Um, and the why, of course, is uh, the Parori fish, which um, uh, has been decimated. We have sea lettuce in our harbour that's uh, growing proliferately, where the, the sea lettuce is a, is a seaweed, which the Parori fish, fish used to grow. So that sea lettuce ends up on Mount Monganui beaches, uh, Waihi beaches, particularly why here from our end, because that's where our water flows out. So um, everyone has uh, sort of um, focusing and, and, and uh, on, on that why, that fish, and that's the focus why we're doing this. Um, so what we've undertaken to do up front is the environmental forensics, because farmers always say, well, tell us what the problem is. So we've, we've put it to and now into our third year of evaluating all our streams up and down our catchments. And this is across, it was originally going to be four catchments, now we're extended to eight catchments, and that's all the catchments flying out for those that are familiar out of the Bowen Town entrance, Waihi Beach. So um, we've done all this environmental forensic work using freshwater ecology, ecologists um, to evaluate our vertebrate, our fish health, and nutrient, um, and also looking at our biodiversity uh, around. Um, our uh, flora and fauna as well. So where we presented that data, or most of that data to the leading farmers, got them on board across the sectors. We've also done a first in New Zealand. We've got all the sectors to sign off on a memorandum of understanding to work together around using GMP practices, which came out of Canterbury. So we've got uh, Zespri, uh, and Avocado New Zealand, uh, Dairy NZ, and Beef and Lamb New Zealand have signed off on this memorandum of understanding so that we can go to the stakeholders um, as a united group to um, to empower them to do some work. We have, and as I've mentioned before, we've got leading Q-fruit growers, uh, avocado growers, uh, dairy and sheep and beef farmers coming together to um, actually uh, lead farmers through the transitional change through their farm environmental plans um, to to uh, to improve environmental outcomes. The interesting thing is what we're actually doing at the moment in a catchment further south of us is actually trying to design a farm environmental plan that uses all the um, the mapping tools like GSI mapping so we can understand overland flow um, and also using LUC principles to understand what's happening on their parcels of land. And that includes the Q-Frit guys because a lot of the Q-Frit guys have got critical source areas where they use, lose copper they're using a lot of copper to, to uh, mitigate against um, a PSA. So we've got a lot of similarities, but then bolt on the module that's appropriate to, to, to kiwi fruit or avocado, to, to dairy or whatever. Um, so that's, we're working through that at the moment. So I, I don't think I need to tell you any more at this stage. I think I've sort of um, covered it all pretty well. Um, So good as gold, Aaron. No, thanks, Rick. Because we are, we have more questions, so we're going to dig into that in some more more depth. Um, Mark, Mark Adams, you want to tell us a bit about your group, what you're doing, and why? Yeah, yeah thanks, Aaron. Um, probably my story isn't as positive as as, as the previous uh, situations that we just heard about. Um, uh, the the uh, our catchment group was was set up in in response to a regulatory process. Um, ECAN uh, several years ago um, was was to, well the commissioners were parachuted into what was perceived as a dysfunctional ECAN 
um, and there that they were charged with um, changing the whole uh, water culture in Canterbury, which was no small task. And, and one of the ways they went about doing that was setting up uh, zone committees. And under those zone committees, they set up catchment groups and that sort of captured all of Canterbury. So um, the O-top zone, or uh, that, uh, for which the, the, the Opahi and Opua sit under, um, we knew this was happening and communities started talking about this was coming and we need to get organised and we need to start thinking about what this is going to look like. But ECAN had limited resources and, and as a result of that, um, they started in the Huronui first and worked their way down. And it was several years later before they got to us. And, and in that time, we'd lost all our momentum. And so not only do, were, do farmers see it as a regulatory response, but, but, but what, when we had little bits of momentum, it kind of stalled just, just through lack of resource. Now, I don't hold this against ECAN at all. Um, in fact, I applaud ECAN for their foresight in adopting a catchment uh, group model for, for addressing water. They, they understood that you can talk about uh, water quality at a high level, but if you're going to drive change, you have to become very specific very quickly. Um, but it's just a, a as, as Roger was talking about, a, a top-down approach is problematic. And, um, and so uh, we have sort of, our catchment group is stalled. We're in a sub-regional um, planning process, uh, the proposed plan change seven. And COVID has sort of, again, stalled that even more. And so as a catchment, we're all sitting and waiting for a third party to determine our fate. And I think that's really sad. And, um, and it's been really hard to, to try and change a, a pervading mindset. Um, and a group of us were thinking about how we might address that. And, and this winter, this autumn winter, we were going to do some work. But again, that's all been, that, that, that's been stalled. Um, so what am I going to do about it? Well, well, I'm going to do something about it. Um, but a, 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 and, and we do have a bit of a plan, um, but it's just it's it's going to take um, just just a a a, a, a repackaging of um, the importance of farm stewardship, uh, the importance of um, uh, positioning our produce from from farming systems that are, are kind to the environment. And, and, and trying to shift it away from just a regulatory response. And uh, while we're locked in that negative mindset, we're, we're missing a trick and, uh, and we can do better. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. When we were talking at the start, Mark said, look, his story's got a few fish hooks in it. I think that's fair to say, Mark, and oh, maybe I should go down the list. But I think it was actually really important to hear that because what we want to get to you today is these things are a great opportunity, but they're not without their challenges. They're not without their difficulties. As you know, in farming, there's no silver bullets and we've all got some real challenges. So um, a part of what we want to talk about later on as we go on is maybe there's not easy solutions, but how do you deal with problems when they come up and what, what's ways to deal with some of those, those big challenges? Um, right, Josh, hopefully you, you've heard that and you've had enough time to get a feel for what Ben has dropped you into. You tell us a bit about your group and, and why it's in place. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, our group... <sighs> Our group's origins go back to 2013 and um, it was good having Mark go just before us because he gave, gave a bit of a background of the Canterbury situation. Uh, in 2013, the Hiranui district was the first cab off the rank for um, the Environment Canterbury's new Canterbury Land and Water Plan. Um, so the commissioners came in and they set some rules through what was supposed to be a um, consultation process using the Zone Committee. Unfortunately, when the plan came out, um, it wasn't overly equitable at all. In fact, um, after it came out, there was a meeting in Waikere and 300 um, rather annoyed farmers showed up and the um, uh, David Bedford, who was the commissioner at um, EHEN at the time, ended up swearing at them. So it was a rather heated meeting. Um, what we discovered through that process was that um, sheep and beef farmers in particular hadn't been represented in the conversation. So out of that, through a sustainable farming fund project, five uh, catchment groups was in the district 
to look and try and provide a voice for these farmers, as well as promoting good management practice as well. And um, so that took them through for a, a few years. And then in 2016, the group incorporated into the Hurunui District Land Care Group. And then in uh, March 2017, I came on as the coordinator. And at that stage, I was really tasked with, um, well, there was two, two key roles that I was trying to pursue. Well, one was to promote good management practice. So we did that through um, helping our farmers get farm environment plans in, con in conjunction with beef and lamb. Um, we also set out to review those farm environment plans. So we got through about a third of our members before we had to postpone that. And on the other side, it was providing a voice and starting to pull together um, a lot of what our farmers have been talking about and put some data behind that as well. So we engaged with the zone committee, we engaged with Environment Canterbury, we got some money to do some research projects and we, and we uh, did a, a survey of all our members and used that to write a report that was well received by Environment Canterbury and the Zone Committee to the point that uh, earlier this year we uh, got a plan change that has partially fixed the issues that our Hurunui plan had. It hasn't completely, but it has meant that our farmers can stop uh, being in a grey area, which they have been for the last uh, seven or so years. So one of the things that we knew that was going to happen though when we're in this policy space is that, um, well, you know, that's going to come to an end and what do we do with our catchment group? So about middle of last year, we started running a few woolshed meetings and asking our members, well, what do we do with this? Because we had discovered that actually, while the policy space is nice, there was actually a lot of uh, spin-off benefits that uh, were more valuable to our members. For example, we engaged with Environment Canterbury uh, last year, or it might have been the year before, I can't quite remember, um, to bring a hill country erosion program back to Canterbury. And that's the first time since um, the end of the catchment boards. So we started, we went to our members, asked them what they, you know, where do we want to go? And, and the key thing that came back was we want to get stuff done on the ground. The policy space is nice and we will continue to have that as a side but really it's quite draining if you have that as your focus and there's a lot more good that can be done in our catchment. So what we're doing now is we've got um, uh, a couple of applications in with, um, particularly with MPI, and I see Louise Askins on the call as well, so it's good to have you here. Um, we've got one into uh, One Billion Trees for a catchment group uh, planting program. And the other one is an application into the extension services program, looking at quite a large scale um, extension service for our farmers. And the key point with that one is really about uh, helping our farmers n navigate the changes that are coming. There's so much that's coming and there's, our farmers have been operating quite a, um, a grey area for so many years. So we just want to be able to help them answer those questions and start to move forward through that. And that's me. Thanks, Josh. No, you did well. Consider what it was about an hour ago, Ben rang and told you you were coming on this call. Excellent. You know your stuff. Thank you. Right oh, so that means uh, the one left is Anna. Tell us a bit about your group, what they're about, what they're doing, and why they exist. Yeah, cheers, Aaron. Um, King Country River Care had its beginnings not dissimilarly to others. Um, plan change one up in Waikato region, that's just over the boundary from us. Uh, there was a group of farmers in the King Country, smallish group, who didn't really like the look of the process that was unfolding. Um, felt that dry stock farmers, perhaps, were, or low intensity farmers, to be fair, weren't getting a very uh, a fair hearing and it wasn't, wasn't looking good for our region if that was going to come our way. So this, this smallish uh, bunch of farmers got together and it did take a little while, but they decided um, to put some money in and fund a coordinator or someone to help actually achieve, um, make some changes and do something about it. So there's about three, three years ago they started and um, 18 months ago they contracted me to do, to give them a hand. Um, I guess initially all farmer funded, those, those sort of 
15 guys started it. Uh, Waikato Regional Council came on board with a grant um, a wee way down the track. And then MPI, Extension Services that Josh was talking about, we've just signed, um, signed a contract with them as well. And it's really like he said, uh, around delivering farm environment plans, supporting good management practice, getting subcatchment groups up and taking ownership of issues um, and, and a few other um, parts we can talk about later. And I've also put in a one billion tree application for planting and fencing, um, same as Josh. So we're all after after the uh, the same pools of money, I guess. But looking to really, uh, I guess from a beginning that was around a reaction to, to regulation that might be coming, very similar story to others. We've we've really moved from from that to a three three key goals. One around thriving rural communities. Uh, another around you know best best implementation of, of good management practice. So um, improving environmental outcomes. And thirdly, we still do definitely look to do some representation and influence influencing policy. Um, and I agree with Josh that can be quite draining some of that, uh, but. I think it's really important to do it. So our our organisation, we believe we're stronger together. Um, we've got a chance to achieve more outside of our farm gates when we when we collectively work together. And um, yeah, I, I think personally, for me, it's a lot about our kids, all of our kids, everyone out there and grandkids having a chance to live and to farm rurally. Um, and yeah, we really have a, a long-term focus. Um, that's it.